let's go to the slides now. This is the meeting at Blue Sky, where the plot to get the cows off was just about hatched. It was thoroughly incubated there at any rate. Now, sage grouse were so abundant at Heart Mountain this summer that uh, I was even able to get a picture of one being flushed by my little English setter named Thelma. Everywhere I went, I was finding sage grouse and uh, molted feathers and tracks and so on and so forth. This was just an instance where she'd already flushed a good number of them, and I happened to be in the right place at the right time with a poorly focused camera. Since 1983, I've had the great privilege, and this is a privilege given me by the refuge personnel. Of course, I've been there long enough now that I've had experience over a larger range of years than anyone who is there at this point, but they have always been accommodating except when the president of my college, who was then Dan Evans, the ex-governor of Washington, got a letter from the assistant director in Portland saying that if I didn't stop agitating for the removal of cows, which are an absolutely imperative management tool on Heart Mountain National Antelope Refuge, that I would be excluded from the refuge. That letter, thank goodness, is still in my file. And the conversation I had with Dan Evans isn't. So here it is, Robinson Draw, and of course that's a lie there. We don't have fires usually, but we do camp. And this is the draw, and there are several things I want to point out here. I'm just going to run through a series of slides that span the years 1983 through the years 2000. And there'll be a blank place in between each year, but I'm not going to try to describe the year. So this is Robinson Draw, a little aspen-filled glade that has its own spring that comes directly out of the ground, 43 degrees Fahrenheit, which we use for cooking and drinking. The spring wanders through the aspens, comes down, and the closest trees there, the lower ones, are willows. And that's where we net our birds. The birds are drawn in off the desert and are, uh, are then netted in our mist nets that are set up at right angles to the stream that goes below the willows. They're coming in for water. And our camping area is up in here. Now, I want you to look at this slope here, which this is pre-fire. And, of course, the dominant plant here is big sagebrush. And here on this side, this is the north-facing slope where everything came back very well. But this was all cheatgrass after the 85 fire. This is 1983. Now, I've had these hippies up here uh, all those years. And I've had, uh, you know, a dozen students or more every year. I put this slide in mainly because... It shows the sagebrush on that south-facing slope. Both these guys have gone on to get their uh, PhDs at various alleged institutions of higher learning. Now, when I came to Robinson Draw, it didn't take me long to notice that there was a piece of cow plop every square meter in the uh, grassland next to my nets, nor that there were no aspen suckers growing. The best that I could find was something like this. And this thing is probably many, many years old, and it's just not going to make it. That is the cow flop. So I asked a good friend in the Fish and Wildlife Service about this. I said, aren't the cows eating these things? Oh, no, Steve. He said, that's not a cow problem or a cattle problem. That's a human problem. And what he believed, and this is a very rational, decent, bright man, was that hunters camping in this site in the fall would remove for firewood the downed aspen logs that were protecting the aspen suckers from predation by the cows. So that was the answer I got at that point. So that was 83. Now, this is after the cows were taken off, and I think it's after the fire. I'm not positive about that. As you can see, the brown on the, um, the airdrop water on so it didn't burn. But the fire did get fairly close to our camp, just up slope. By uh, 1988, the uh, aspens that had been only old aspens when we got there, so three years after the cows were removed from this site, this is what it looked like. Now, and I may be able to show, show you this later, it's impossible for me to find a place to put my wall tent 
unless I destroy a good number of, of aspens, which uh, always grieves me. But this is all post-cow, and it is not related to fire. Now, this is our kitchen area, and um, I show this just because uh, it shows that the growth by 88 of the aspen suckers that were relieved of the pressure of cows. Now, this shows uh, fairly well the, uh, some of the effects of the fire. The fire came to uh, above camp and below camp. It missed many of the willows, but it got some on, on this end. This is, um, this is 91, the proliferation of cheatgrass in here and also the beginning of the recovery of the native shrubs and some native grasses. This is just a red-tailed hawk that we had uh, captured and banded and were releasing. That was the only picture I had of that slope for that year. And here again, you can see the slope beginning to recover in the early 90s, where there had been almost 100% cheat grass. And as I said earlier, I would not have predicted this could happen. When cheat grass took over there, the Fish and Wildlife Service said, well, we didn't know it would grow there. The fire that came through there was set. It was a prescribed burn that got away, much like the one that took the Vine Creek drainage out in 1992. So here's a year or so later, the same cooking area, and you can see what these uh, aspens have done. All this is no cows. This is not fire-related. Then what started happening was the older aspens, which were um, forces that say over-mature at the beginning, began to fade and fall. And there's still a pretty good group of them. This group here is still in good shape. These have all gone down. These, this has already gone down, but they're being replaced by the younger ones very rapidly. And this is up in the, on the side looking out, and again you can see the beginning of the recovery of these shrubs. And here you can sort of see the height of the uh, young aspens, and there's a good shot of them. So some of the older ones, even those that are not ancient, are fading, but they're being replaced very rapidly by these and the slope. Most of the grasses you see here are now native grasses. I'm going to check to see what year I'm at here. Oh, 98. Now, this is a beautiful place looking out here from the uh, rock outcropping above camp. You look out. This is again 1983, and that's Brady's Butte right there, that promontory. And over to the left is Steens Mountain, about 95 miles away. So there's 1983, and that's 2000. Okay, I think I'm going to show you right now the the critical difference between cows and no cows. If there are cows there, you have to hang from the ceiling. <laughs> well, if one of my students did, it, did that, he or she would not survive. In any case, here I am with a can of lips in my hand uh, by the banding table up uh, below the spring, and uh, you'll see this, <laughs> you'll see this tree in the next picture. This is 1984, and this is 1994. Same tree, and the table you saw was right there. So I don't let anybody tell you that cows don't count. They do count. Okay, the whole business of wildlife biology today, I'm a little bit dubious about it. I happen to think that uh, there should be a lot less statistics and chemistry and a lot more poetry in wildlife schools these days. There seems to be a haunting fear that someone somewhere who graduates from them might have uh, an appreciation for beauty. Well, on the mountain and elsewhere, there's now a great effort to deny the effects of cow removal and ascribe these changes to the end of a drought, or especially fire, since fire is our savior now. People are saying, well, that's just because of fire. But it's not drought or fire. In this case, it's cows and the absence of cows. Now, if someone could help me get the overhead on, I'll uh, drift through these other things here. Now, the data that I'm going to show you comes from the work of Dr. Crawford at Oregon State University and his crews and cooperators. I want to emphasize that this is wonderful work and the data are often very hard won. I know Dr. Crawford and have encountered him many times at meetings. This has all been provided to me by refuge personnel. But I want to emphasize the fact that these data are not easily won. There's a lot of very hard work at, uh, at uncomfortable times of year. 
Now, I have gone through the data, and a man named Robert MacArthur, who was probably the most famous of the ecologists in the early part of the century, has said that new science is to search for patterns in nature. Well, I have searched for patterns in this body of data, which includes a couple of major components. One component is the counts of males on lex, males on these breeding grounds or dancing grounds or whatever one wants to call them. They are properly called, I suppose, lex. And uh, these counts have been going on since the late 80s or early 90s on both Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge and Heart Mountain National Wildlife Refuge. What you'll see from me is the sorting of these patterns, not that there's anything untrue about the patterns that I've attempted to elucidate. As you can see, there's, there aren't any serious questions about this. But people who work with these kinds of information know that there are a lot of complicating factors. I would not, under any circumstances, stand here and claim that any positive effects that I will attempt to uh, describe to you came solely from the removal of cows. But I will say that it is very likely that that was a major influencing factor. The fact of the matter is that there are two very important research papers in the huge library of research that has been done on sage grouse. And both of these papers, done I think in both cases by Dr. Crawford's students, point to the importance of what is called in the papers residual cover in protecting the sage grouse nest from predation. Residual cover is grass. Residual cover is grass that cows didn't eat. The absence of residual cover is the absence of grass that cows did eat. So the question I pose to you now, and I invite you to look at these data, is has the removal of cows affected sage grouse? Now here is a, a series of lek counts from 1991, 1996, and this year that you can see that in six of the seven leks, there are more males on those leks in 2000 than there were in 1996. Overall, the trend is down, but the good news is that the cows were taken off in 1993, and one would expect a couple of years anyway of recovery before anything became at all positive. Now, what these personnel said to me a couple of years ago was, uh, well, we got the cows off, now where's the payoff for wildlife? I'm suggesting that we may be looking here at part of the payoff for wildlife. Let's go to Sheldon. In eight of the nine lakhs, there were more in 2000 than there were in 1996. And not ubiquitously, here's something went from 27 to 16 to 46, and this is about the same as that here on Sheldon from 39 to 44 to 48, 10, 5, 10, so on and so forth. And these are 9 of 25 lexes. I chose the lex on the basis of completeness of the data. Okay, next. So here's the Heart Mountain summary. The total number of males on the lex, 157 in 1991, down to a low of 41 in 96, and up to 78 in 2000. Now, the average number of males on the lek, 39 to 10, and doubled again to 20. Now, there were 46% immatures in the Heart Mountain population in 1999 and 2000, and that is above the level at which these biologists think the population can be maintained, which is 38%. Next. Now, here's the Sheldon summary, total of 295. Now, this is a, a lot of leks. This is perhaps 25 leks. Down to 136, and then back up to 252 in 2000. Average number of correct, 33 to 15, back up to 28. These are all measures of reproductive success, and uh, I won't go over all of them, but they include nest initiation, nest success, brood success, broods per nest that are initiated, Chicks that are recruited to the population that grow up and become part of that population that make it through their juvenile stage. Chicks per hen and recruitment. 
Now, all of these figures are uh, remarkably up, 64% in that early section, 99 up to 100%. Nest success went from 20 to 37 post-cow, and now it's up to 60. Brood success, 42, down a little bit, but now up to 56. 6%, 14%, 33%, and 6 for brood, less than 1. 2.1, doubling now in 2000 to 4.2. Six per hen, four hundredths of a chick per hen, to three tenths of a chick per hen, to 1.4 chicks per hen. I always like to use the mode rather than the average. I've never seen 0.4 chick except in a raptor's mouth. This is, uh, as they say, the bottom line. Recruitment, the, the percentage that the population increases before the winter season, 2% in those early days, 15% shortly post Post cow and now up to 46 percent. Okay, a bunch of shut that off and turn the lights back on, and I'll wind this up. So I think that this is wonderful. This is the largest two hunks. It's really two hunks. We hope eventually they'll be joined of cattle-free, not always horse-free, but cattle-free sage-grouse habitat in the world. Now I said that one of the things that I think characterizes the wildlife profession, the teaching of wildlife now, is the haunting fear that and this is a modification of H.L. Uh, Mencken's definition of Puritanism, the haunting fear that someone somewhere is enjoying himself, the haunting fear that someone somewhere is going to be sensitive to beauty. I'm pretty much of a wimp in that regard, and uh, I was, in fact, a bit overwhelmed by what I saw at Robinson Draw and elsewhere on Hard Mountain uh, this summer. I was very much pleased to see these things, which I think are, in many ways, the essence of wildness. I was quite excited, and at one point, as I walked out toward <laughs> in the direction of Teens Mountain and, and that country over there, where I was, it was dry, but there was a storm over the Steens, and the sun was rising behind that, and suddenly my dog kicked up a good batch of sage grouse, and they rumbled off, and I wrote in my notebook, the rising sun behind the Steens, pushing red ahead of it through the rain over Tiger Notch and the grouse exploded, rumbled into that as a background, then scattered and flew high over our draw toward the next ridge. And I am always reminded that people like us are concerned with wildness. And I think many of us have a vision that's very close to that of Robinson Jeffers, the poet. When we look forward, the city's gone down, the people fewer and the hawks more numerous. When man, who is one of the noblest of the four-footed mammals, regains the dignity of room, the value of rareness. Thanks.